Hello friends and welcome to the Weekend Catch-Up Club podcast, the coffee morning gaming show brought to you every week where two friends hang out and chat about some of the latest stories going on in the industry. You can follow the show on a number of platforms or watch the video version over on YouTube. Your support is hugely important to us, so keep subscribing to never miss an episode. This is episode 72 and joining me as always is my amazing co-host James McClellan. Jamie, how are you? I am here and awake. You're here and awake? I, I'm, <laughs> I swear my intro to the show gets more and more like I'm barely alive every week, but <laughs> I'm a, how you doing, mate? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm surviving COVID, uh, feeling way better. Obviously, we, we didn't have a, a show last week because I was feeling super yucky, but feeling way better this morning. And excited because we are joined by a very special guest, friend of the show. Is this your fifth appearance, Christina? I think so. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> Just a regular now. We're going to have to make you like a third co-host or something. Like, make it official or something. Of course, Christina <laughs> is the associate external producer at TT Games. And we've got her on the show today because she's going to be talking a little bit about a very special game which is coming out in just a few days. Christina, what is it? Tell us about it. <laughs> uh, I think it's Spyro. <laughs> the no, Spyro Remaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've already had that, haven't we? Yeah, yeah it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> the Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga is coming out. In free yes! <laughs> Finally coming out as well. That's been a long time in, in the making. It just looks so good. And it's finally here. And it's going to be a birthday present to myself because it's my birthday on Monday. So I'm definitely going to be buying that and just gushing like crazy at the humor and the silliness and just how good little plastic lego blocks can look on these new consoles nowadays it looks it looks incredible it looks absolutely incredible it yeah the, the team have done an amazing job on it it just looks beautiful yeah yeah it's crazy i think the trailers are all in-game footage as well which is really cool i know jamie are you are you excited for this one i yeah, the the hype has been. I've been waiting to get my hands on it for ages. I I love the Lego games. I love Lego. And I, I I never grew out of Lego ever, and I played the first Lego Star Wars game. I was I was at a friend's house, and he was like, "Oh, you should check this out." I was like, nah. and sat down because I didn't really know what I was sitting down to play. And about five minutes later, I I was heading home to buy a copy. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I don't need you for the weekend. I got to go play games, and yeah, I've played every single one since. Maxed most of them for achievements. I've put hours into these games, yeah. And so yeah, and and I love Star Wars as well. So, but I'm very very hyped. Very it's, very hyped. <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome because thinking thinking back at how far the lego games have come because like the like the very first ones were like indiana jones the original the original kind of trilogy of a new hope empire and jedi and it was back then it was almost like uh, like for like the scenes from the movie and they would bring like the tongue-in-cheek kind of humor to it add like an extra level of silliness to it but it was just like the mumble mode as as we were talking about uh, you know kind of off air there and it was or sometimes it was using the the sound bites of the movies but they were doing their kind of um the, the like spoof versions of it whereas now like the lego franchises and and tt games uh, who who produce them and create them they do like original stories now. They do proper wind uh, and voice acted dialogue now, and they like they've really grown into these incredible productions now. They're not just little like movie tie-ins with a like a spoof kind of slant to it. Like they're really in in pretty incredible in how far they've come. And I remember my one of my favorite ones was. I think it was Lego Batman 2, where you got to drive around Gotham City in the Lego Batmobile, and there was I think there was that was one of the first ones to have like proper voice acting as well, and now you're getting the whole saga of um, is it episodes one to nine, uh, Christina? It was like all of them entirely. Mm -hmm. I just can't wait to play through them all. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to just putting mumble mode on. For the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> it was always one of my favourite things. Like, absolutely, it was one of my favourite things about the series. Was the, um, but it, it was always really clever as well to me because I love the fact that we had for years the mumble mode type stuff, and then 
they evolved perfectly. And but it always cracked me up that the the little sound bites and snippets were used cleverly. So what you, there there was bits and pieces of lines. I'm trying to think of an example, and I can't because brain. But the the lines were always used perfectly. That you would have a line from the film which would have a particular scene which could be quite dark and heavy. But the the actual little cutscene that you would get around it would just be tweaked just a little bit, and there'd be little bits of humor in the background. Or it's like Nick Fury constantly drinking milkshakes throughout the entire series of the Marvel stuff, and all that, <laughs> all these little bits that crack me up. Oh, I love them. I could fanboy over the Lego game for far too long. So. I know, I know. So, Christina, can you can you tell us a little bit about? Like your role as a, an external producer at TT Games and what that kind of involves, and um, just tell us a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, um, without going into too much detail, um, I basically am like a point of contact for external studios, fair party um, studios, etc. Um, like the go between between uh, go between between <laughs> the the go to person between my teams and the dev the external devs as well um i also do fun things like jira assigning tasks you know all the all the fun jury things um and i get to look at different parts of the company as well like marketing and stuff which is really cool so i'm involved in most of that as well um mm. but yeah mostly i talk to external um parties and developers and stuff which is really cool I get to that's, meet a lot of really cool people that I wouldn't I was have met. Gonna say that sounds like super exciting. <laughs> you get you get to yeah, kind of a good uh, view of the landscape over all the different touch points of of the development. It's not just like the coding or the QA. It's it's the marketing side as well. And so, you know, a lot of the times we don't really get an understanding of like the marketing of of the video games is such a huge machine, uh, uh, like part of getting advertising space and and designing all of the. Uh, promotional materials and things as well it's like we don't really get a good kind of look uh, or um what's the word uh understanding of what that actually entails and obviously your role as a, an external producer you really get a good kind of view of all everything that's involved about bringing a game to the store shelves or the digital storefronts yeah i think a lot of people do forget as well that you have teams internally but you do have external teams as well and I think that people sometimes like forget or don't realize that there are people in between that that are making the rest of the stuff work. Um, mm -hmm. I think external producers are quite important, actually. <laughs> you wouldn't have <laughs> all the information getting passed over. Um, some teams are just, like very busy in their own section that they wouldn't really have the time to retain half the stuff that we have to keep hold of um, and pass it on and stuff. So. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool role. Um, it's stuff I lo I've loved doing in QA as well. They're working with different developers and stuff. Um, so I think QA set me up for for speaking to people externally quite well. <laughs> I can I can imagine like, just good. just like aligning the teams and like that communication mm -hmm. part of understanding like where where each department is at and aligning everybody is such a such a hugely important kind of role and obviously you mentioned your your history in QA you've worked on some amazing amazing properties um in the in the past and obviously your um it's, it's galvanized you made you kind of bulletproof for for your role now at um at TT Games and it's just like it's, it's hugely awesome to, to kind of to see and you know we get to have you on the show as much as possible so we get to talk about this kind of stuff it's <laughs> awesome yeah I d that's one thing as well like what I do like about my role is I like talking to people um, I don't. I think since I've like grown in games that I've, I'm a little less afraid to speak to people now. I had really bad anxiety before I started um, working in games, so I think it's it's helped. So yeah, especially with your podcast as well, it does help. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's the cool thing about podcasts, especially like like our format, other other kind of shows as well. They just like to get people on and, and just chat and mm. just like hear hear their stories and, and their backgrounds and just kind of learn and listen and it's that's what's awesome about podcasts i know jamie's a huge fan of obviously like making his own podcast um you know but also consuming podcasts as well and it's just a great kind of format you feel like you're getting in on a conversation that you may never necessarily be a part of and you feel included and that's what is, was really great about 
big podcast for me. And Jamie, I love, love your thoughts on on this kind of stuff as well. Yeah, I I mean, as you know, I listen I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I don't I don't do that sleep thing that everyone's so keen about. Like it's, it's not my not my bag. So I have an awful lot of time to consume various media and. When I do eventually get to the point where my, at least my body needs to rest somewhat, then that's when I'll lie down and just listen to all sorts of different things. I find I have always loved listening to interesting people talk about things they're interested in. It is one of my favourite things to do. Is and and I will and anything. It doesn't even have to be a topic that I've particularly got a background or interest in. If you've got a couple of people sat down who are really passionate about a thing and telling you about it. It'll fascinate me endlessly. So I've uh, always listened to bits and pieces of conversation, like um, even pre-podcast, almost like just people giving talks about interesting subjects or panel discussions at cons and that sort of thing. Always loved it. And then once I actually got into doing podcasts, and I was, it's my absolute, it's what well, it's my absolute favorite way to produce content. Much as I love streaming and love and videos and all of it. My favorite way to produce content is just to sit down with people and go, wait, let's just talk crap for the next hour, or in my case, four hours usually, because I can't stop. And then, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And I think for gaming in particular, it's brilliant because when you do get to, you get to have conversations with people behind the scenes that you otherwise might not have got as much interaction with, and you find out a lot of interesting bits and pieces and get a better understanding of the entire industry as a whole, which like I said, anything that just just interesting, interesting people talking interesting stuff. It's the only way I can really put it, which is I've and I've said it about three times now, but it's, it is my favourite thing. I love it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of interesting things that are going on within the industry at the moment, we've got quite the list of of headlines. We all, obviously because we missed last week's show um there's there's even more stuff there's even more stuff to talk about so we may not get through it all but you know what i think we're going to have a pretty good stab at it so shall we shall we begin with the first topic um it was i'm trying to think when i actually got unveiled it was obviously hogwarts legacy was um the big game that warner brothers studios um re- revealed a really impressive deep dive trailer as part of the playstation state of play was it I'm trying to think. When was it last week or the week before? I'm trying to, trying to remember when it was now. It was, but it, it was. This was a game that was talked about and hyped up for a while. That there was a Harry Potter, um, like universe type of game in the works, and everybody was excited for it, and nobody kind of knew really what it was. And then we got that trailer ages ago. I think it was last year. Uh, at a state of play again with with playstation and that's when we got like that first kind of little teaser trailer and it unveiled a lot but there was no real kind of gameplay as such but it was all engine stuff and then just just the other week there we got a proper like commentary walkthrough of all of the systems everything that you can do in this game and i don't know how you guys were feeling but with everything that's kind of going on around the kind of harry potter ip at the moment I'm still hugely excited for this game because it looks amazing. It's the world of, of kind of uh, wizards and fantasy creatures and the sorting hat to go into your different houses, creating your own character and all of these fantastic beasts and everything like that. Like a proper RPG set within Hogwarts. And I, I'm still hugely excited for this. I think it's really great that the, the, the developers and the creators of this project are really getting to come out and show what they've been working on. And it just looks amazing. Like visually, it looks, it looks great. All the different gameplay ideas that are going on in there, different mechanics. I'm, I'm still hugely excited for this game. And I want to get everybody's opinions today on what were your thoughts on Hogwarts Legacy, the deep dive trailer? I think that Doris has done an amazing job on that, to be fair. Um, it's the game I wanted when I was like, I don't know, 15 or something. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember um, Order of the Phoenix. I think it was PlayStation 2, actually. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Order of the Phoenix, and then there was The Prince of Azkaban as well. Um, I think it was on GameCube. I had it on GameCube. Not sure. Um, I always loved those games because... Prison of Azkaban was so good. Like, you could ride Buckbeak around the, the grounds. Um, 
you could explore Hogwarts, even though it was a little bit cut off some of the rooms because it was like, oh, you can't go in here. Yeah, the staircase yeah. won't move. So it was a bit like, oh, this is so annoying. I wish I could just go in. And then Order of the Phoenix was like, Goblet of Fire was sort of top down, wasn't it? So it wasn't mm. quite the same. Yep. Um, whereas Order of the Phoenix was like, right, this is new. You can do your spells yourself. So if you turn, uh, move the dual shock stick, analog stick, in a certain direction, you'll do this spell. So you actually felt like you were a student there, even though you were still playing as Harry. Um, you got to explore everywhere in the castle. You had a map. Like, the game case had a map inside it. And I use that map. I put it on my wall and I actually use that map. Um, was that, it was had that the, the Marauder's spell. map by any chance? With the, the old footsteps I think, I think and everything? It, I think Could it was, be? you know. I think it was, because it did have footsteps on the outside. So I think it was. Um, and it had like, the spell list as well. So if you forgot how to do a certain spell, you'd have the the list there. And it was it was, it was was really cool. Um, even though it was the story of Order of the Phoenix, so you couldn't really just... It was sort of linear. Mm, but you could yeah. explore stuff, which is really good. Um, so Hogwarts Legacy is like those games just but it's your story this time rather than the harry story which yeah. is kind of cool um visually it looks great i think avalanche have done a, a really good job on it to be fair so yeah and jimmy it's yeah i mean it, it it's stunning to look at it, it, it's so pretty and it is that is a, a world that it's cries out to be played with and played in um, and who? It's one of those things. Like, who doesn't want to do magic? Like, it's it's <laughs> the, the thought of being a, a a wizard is immensely appealing. So it does. It looks absolutely fantastic. It was one that sort of um, uh, slipped me by for a while after the initial release. It was one of those. It was one of those titles for me that was like, oh, this looks amazing, and then it went quiet. And I'm forever. There's there's so many games. We we talk about it every week. There's so many games. <laughs> And so you sort of hit a point where, oh, and it, then it came back with a, a resurgence. So as you see, obviously there's a lot going on around the IP, which is uh, a whole other topic. But the game itself, like purely the game itself, it just it looks phenomenal. It, it does look phenomenal, and it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun to play. So it it does. And it, I, I was watching it, and it made me think back to. Like the old games that, that Christina mentioned, but also, do you guys remember that old Fable game that was a Kinect experience where you could do the gestures to do like casting spells and everything like that? Mm -hmm. And it, it got me thinking, you know what? I, I think the time is, is, is now right for like motion controlled like spell casting, like like what the Kinect was trying to do way back on the Xbox 360, and even to a degree with the original Xbox One, but never really capitalized on it. I think like today, whether that's like a VR experience or just uh, like the, the sensor bar kind of thing, what we used to have with Kinect, it's like if that was a project that was maybe getting announced today, I kind of feel like there would be way more excitement for it to say, okay, I can now do Wingardium Leviosa by just like waving my hands or, or waving the wand in the air. Because I remember way back, you got the motion control. I think, I think it maybe was a PlayStation game or like way back, it was the wand that had the motion control kind of in it. But it wasn't entirely, you know, the, the mechanics maybe were not as accurate as what it probably could be today. I just think that is a franchise that is so rich for like other interactivity mechanics like VR or like motion controls. And it gets me really excited about what, what can be done because technology is like advancing at such a crazy rate and like games look and play amazing now. And I'm as I'm hugely excited for Hogwarts Legacy, it also gets me super excited for, for like what could happen. I mean, we look at things like, like Half-Life Half -Life Alex, right? With the motion controls and that really kind of demonstrated what a VR title could be. It wasn't like a an on-rails experience. It was like a proper first-person shooter with physics and everything like that. And it gets me excited to say, what could a Harry Potter game be where it's like a full VR experience like Half-Life Alex or or something? It's like, man, the future is so rich for what, what can be created from all these amazing developers that just want to create something incredible. It just you mentioned motion controllers and my, my first thought this is 
probably not even relevant to like do, like actual motion controls. You ever played Twilight Princess on the Wii? Yes. <laughs> and yes. <laughs> you have the Wii, and you could just do this, <laughs> yeah. and the sword, yeah. <laughs> the sword would just just attack. Oh my god, I love that game. It was so good. I know. That that was but, a that was a revelation for me. Like the like because we <laughs> we we grew up with Zelda games. We it was the idea of are you kidding me? I can actually wave my sword in <laughs> in real life. And but obviously, yeah, you do you do this you do the spamming kind of thing as opposed to like proper proper kind of swiping gestures. Hmm. But it was that moment where it was like, oh my god, this is it! I can actually wave my sword, and Link will swing his sword. This is what we're talking about. This is what we are we're dreaming of. And I'm um, obviously Skyward Sword tried to do it like with even more kind of nuance. And I don't think it, I don't think it terribly worked out well for for the feedback in the fan base. But again, like that motion what was it what was it Wii Motion Plus or something that they added? That was the attachment that goes on the bottom of the Wii Mote to make yeah, it yeah, way little, more way more accurate. Yeah. You could like you could turn it and also swipe it and do it like very slow gestures and swipe in uh, verticals or horizontals or diagonals. It's like bring that stuff back because that was experimental and so cool. And I know it, people still like their dual thumbsticks and the, the, the controllers but also i also kind of lament the loss of that kind of crazy experimental phase of of certain games and developers that what they were trying to do back then i suppose like, that was mainly the way wasn't it there was just motion so yeah mm. yeah mm. Was, i remember the connect releasing <laughs> oh do i remember the connect <laughs> the uh i when the 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 first connect was out, I, I reviewed and I cannot ever remember the name of the game without looking it up. But it was something like Black Watch or Black Fire or something along those lines. But it was about uh, a private security firm, and so you were essentially a mercenary. So you were getting sent into you know, these various areas to deal with conflict and things. And you went through the training of, and it was it was supposed to be. They build it as God love them. They build it as. You will be in the shoes of a Black Horse mercenary. You will understand <laughs> what it is to know combat. And I'm stood there, and it's like, right, to aim the gun, raise your hand. To fire the gun, close your fist. And I thought, I don't think anyone is doing this anywhere. <laughs> and it just sort of, like, I loved the idea. I loved it, but it wasn't quite there. But they were trying. Like, they were trying to do something really, really cool, really interesting. Yeah. And then, and I remember Connectables. And the Fable game was Fable Heroes. I've got them all sat in a cupboard along uh, with the Connect. So, and, like, Connectables. I have sat there like this, stroking the tiger <laughs> that isn't there, <laughs> feeling like the biggest idiot in the world, going, like, I don't know what I am doing with my life. But I I love the notion of uh, of motion controls and VR and everything. And then it's some, some of the experiences haven't always delivered, but it's usually due to the... The limitations at the time, well, there's only so much you can do with the the tech up to a point. Mm. This is why it's so exciting seeing developers come along and then go, "Oh, we can push it this little bit further, though. Or, we can push it this little bit further, though." So, yeah, I'll, it's yeah, like being able to spell cast or, or imagine like Marvel games. Imagine being able to do all the Doctor Strange motions, yeah, and then you know opening a slingwing portal, all that sort of stuff. It, oh. Yeah. Well, you, you say that you say that, Jamie. But you remember, like that ge- that fantasy game that Obsidian are working on for Xbox that got an uh, announcement trailer a couple of years ago, and it was oh, the yeah. little the little clip that they showed. It was it was the sword in, in the right hand, and the hand was doing the kind of the Doctor Strange gesture to to summon a spell. You're thinking, is this a is this a VR game? Is this like an Oculus game or something? But it's obviously going to be like a Skyrim, Elder Scrolls yeah. kind of RPG. But as you, you get thinking about that, whenever you see a first person, something going on with your hands, it was the same with Ghostwire Tokyo, which just came out as well. I thought that was going to be a VR title because it looked like a VR title because it's all first person. It's casting spells with hands. And that gets me like super excited. And I, one thing I actually forgot to put in th- the show notes is obviously the PS PSVR 2 got like a big kind of announcement and, and blog post on the PlayStation website. And tying that in with the um, like the Horizon game that got the trailer for PSVR two, man, that looks good. And that like immersive experience of a tall neck literally walking over you in first person. And we've yet to see what the actual gameplay for that is going to be. But like all the tech that's going into PSVR two for proper, um, like like joysticks uh, that are 
I guess like the motion control as well as like the thumbsticks on them, like proper proper ergonomic controls, as well as a, a, an updated headset and the new tech that's going into that. I th- I, th- I really think that VR could finally maybe punch through into a bit more of a, of a mainstream. It's still it's still incredibly niche because it's an expensive bit of like add on hardware, but like what the developers can do and what games are coming out and experiences are coming out is just like so hugely exciting and. God, give us a Harry Potter game or a, or a Doctor Strange game. That that must be in the works at Marvel Games, right? There's, they must be saying, let's do a VR game or first person game where it's Doctor Strange and you're casting the spells in first person with your hands. Because you see kids doing it, like when they come out of the cinema of a Doctor Strange movie, they're they're doing the gesture, to, like they're acting out. It's like not just kids, not just kids. Jamie's doing it as well. <laughs> I never stopped making. I I will tell you now and, and absolutely shame myself to the entire internet. If I walk into Tesco's in town here, as I walk towards the automatic doors, I will never not go. <laughs> as I walk in, <laughs> I cannot stop myself, and I get funny looks all the time. I'm like, eh, okay, magic. Like, I never lost that love of me. But it's probably why I'm so heavily into a lot of the the, the worlds I am and. Obviously, Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. I, I get to, but I never lost the love of make believe. I don't think people ever should. I know. And see, games are great for it. So, see, I used to do like the, like the Jedi kind of push, the Jedi gesture. But until I got like looked at by the security guard as if I was a, a weirdo, I uh, I kind of stopped doing it. <laughs> do you ever wonder if one day we'll have like the Oasis from Ready Player One? You know, like that, the full yeah, that's the, the dream, right? Suit. Yeah, maybe minus the pain receptor things that are in the suit because they would suck. Um, would imagine suck, playing yeah. Halo and your shield starts going down and it's like you're like shaking, you're like, Oh my god, no, that would be horrible. <laughs> um, but how cool would it be to just have like a full immersion suit? You oh could just you just be in your house, put yeah. it on, like with the um, so, like the treadmill, the omnidirectional treadmill kind of thing that they have as well. <laughs> yeah. I know, yep. I know those those do exist, but I don't think much, like mm. hardly anything, actually supports them or use them. But I mean, I mean that's that's what that. we're going for. Yeah. Imagine having that in your house, though. It's just not it's not fitting in my room. But like. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to, trying to think of the chaos of like have having a party night of your friends around, and you have to they all have to mm. instead of bringing your console around to your friend's house, you have to bring your <laughs> Omnidirectional <laughs> VR unit all the way down to your friend's house. Like, what kind of but space are you going to need? That's the whole point. You never leave. You never. <laughs> you never see anyone in physical space again. That's which is the dystopian side of it. I mean, it's you know, it's very much into the obviously way the far flung future. But the amount of times that I've got really excited about the potential for VR and then read some sci-fi story or watched something where it's like, and then when VR fully comes about, that's when the human race stagnates and no one leaves the home. I'm like, oh, don't put a dampener on it. I was really looking forward to that. So it swings and roundabouts. But yeah, yeah. it would be amazing. I would love a full haptic suit. I would love the, the full immersion. I would, and as it stands, VR for me is a little bit... Well, I haven't got massively into it because a lot of it is experiences over actual full-length games which and i tend to you know i tend to be looking for story driven or multiplayer experience that's usually yeah. my two things um but you do obviously i've i've you know said that I've, I've certain mobility issues and things like that and some of the games that are motion capture on that a lot of them require a little bit more standing up than i necessarily want to be doing as well so sure i find myself sort of shying away from so which is a shame stuff like beat saber like, I really want to play Beat Saber, but I would probably fall over a lot and I would definitely break my television. So it's kind of a <laughs> maybe not for me at the minute, but no, VR. I love Beat Saber. I'm just waiting for you to do Phasmophobia on stream in a VR headset, Jamie. I'm, I'm waiting I for that. I know. I need to. I need to. But it's too it's, scary. Oh, I've, to be honest, Faz has sort of lost some of the fear factor for me at this point. Um, it's it's become a really intense, weird puzzle game, so which is fine. Um, but Alan is currently trying to beat my level by before the level reset that they're doing because uh, mine. I'm currently at something like one thousand three hundred because I didn't stop playing it at, at release, and he's at about two hundred. And he's like, "I can do this. Good luck, mate." But yeah, I want to play that on VR. That would be fun. And yeah. that with haptics. See, that's another one. Imagine if you're sat there and a ghost can tap you on the shoulder. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I, but I'd love it. 
I'd freak out, but I would definitely love it. So yeah. now, now I'm thinking about that, like the the vest or whatever it is, it gives you like little kind of vibrations as if it's sh- like shivering or some kind of simulation for like that that feeling you get when um like that the, the hairs on on the back of your neck stand yeah. up, like some kind of way to freak you out like that like i mean tapping on the shoulder is actually a really good one but that would that yeah. would scare the utter shit out of me and i would not oh, yeah. be able to play that <laughs> no i'd be a puddle under my desk but i would i would still do it because <laughs> it, it would be so good like, yeah there was so much they could do um and i know and, and, and they're trying to do obviously and I'm, you know, I'm not saying it they're not doing enough there's so much that they can potentially do and it's just a case of you know finding the right fan choices and, and getting the tech for it and all of that it'll be yeah there's there's lots of exciting possibilities mm. yeah god that's that's i tell you what that is that is quite a rabbit hole conversation that we went down there after starting with hogwarts legacy we went we went quite, quite the tangent but i love it and that's what the show's all about <laughs> yep. so next week- next next topic um have you guys been playing much elden ring you got i i talk about it all the time on the show you guys I, i'm pretty sure the listeners are bored about me hearing about it have, have you been playing any at all so i bought it mm-hmm. and i got the nice little edition and i was like oh this is really pretty i got really excited for it because i thought really cool i put it in and I, mm-hmm. and I was enjoying it, and I was trying to cheese the first tree senator because I didn't realise I couldn't kill it yet. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was dragging it into the doorway, and you know, stabbing it and stuff, and yeah. Uh, and then I gave up, so I changed character. I made an astrologer, and then I was getting the hang of it. I was having fun, you know. Yeah. I d- I'm not a Dark Souls person. Um, I was enjoying it, and then I managed to kill like the the big troll guy who jumps down. I don't yep. remember his name. I'm gonna get butchered for it. It's fine. I don't think they have um, names. They're just like the big giant troll things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I killed him over and over again with my wolves. Um, and I was like, yeah, this is great. So I was getting, you know, souls and stuff, blah blah. Um, and then I was like, right, we can team up. So I joined a multiplayer game, and I was like, right, I'm gonna get past his archers, and then when I get past them, I'm gonna continue by myself. Yeah. So I'm plodding along, you know, we, we're killing all the archers. And then we get to the next part, and I'm like, right. And then everyone's like waving, like, you know, see you later, with the bonfire and stuff. Um, and then my game kicks me back into my world from before the archers. Oh, no. So it turns off. Oh, yeah, because progress yeah. Isn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't carry over. Yeah. You've joined somebody's game, and they haven't joined yeah. your game. And yeah. So oh. it turned off. Um, <laughs> haven't touched it since. And Rowan has been on it. So, um, yeah, it's Rowan's game now. Oh. So that's my experience with Elden Ring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, oh, I, I feel that in a, in a big way because um, I've been playing it pretty much non-stop since it launched. I, I got, Jamie knows this, and probably some viewers are, are sick of me talking about this as well, but I got into the Souls game last year in, a, in, a, in, a, in an incredibly obsessive way. For some reason, a Demon Souls remake, just that was that was the one it just clicked for me and ever since then i've been just hoovering up all the all the games apart from secular that's the only one i haven't really played and i just fell in love with them and i and i and i began to understand them began to get with their really weird obtuse um mm-hmm. systems uh, and game mechanics and um but i just fell in love with them and then of course elden ring we played it non-stop i'm now level 151 or two i think i am just now i'm just obsessed with it and um but yeah it's like you just want to play co-op and you want the progress to be like to carry over between your game and their game so you're not going back and it's like oh my god i've just played so much i've done so many amazing things like in my friend's game and now i've got to do them all in my game fuck so yeah there is that and unfortunately that they've always been like that um by saying that i i found an, an amazing um i say found I, I went on on youtube and got the guides for it got the walkthroughs <laughs> to for where there's just an amazing um area to farm like crazy amounts of of, of runes to level up so that's why i'm like on an, an obscene level and um I'm, I'm constantly finding areas in the game where it's just amazing there's a ferry that just ran past <laughs> audio listeners are missing out we've got pedro in the chat <laughs> running past on camera um what was i saying yeah so i was i was it's the way the game that teaches you nothing now 
a lot there's been a lot of discourse online about whether that's a good thing a good thing or a bad thing. Souls players love it, but anybody new come out anybody new coming into the series is like, well, why can't you just tell me what I'm supposed to do here? I have to go into the menus. I have to go online and find out. Like, this is such bad game design. You know, for a lot of people are coming. And I, I I, can't argue that at all. But at the same time, I love how weird and uh, uh, cryptic it is. At the same time, I'm constantly discovering stuff. And then you're thinking, oh, if only I'd known that like 20 hours ago, that would have been so handy. And um, it is a very kind of niche style of game but it does feel quite special and it's, it's the way in which the developers have crafted that experience into and put it into an open world kind of scenario but still kept it feeling like a tightly focused tightly crafted souls game and the environments that i'm constantly finding i'm, I'm nearly 70 hours into the game and some people have been playing for like 160 hours and stuff and they're constantly finding new stuff and you think that's that is an incredible achievement f to to be able to have that level of craft, but blown up into such a huge um, like sandbox of a, of of this world. And no wonder it took so long for them for them to to uh, to create this game because uh, it, it really does show. Uh, not perfect by any means, and it's not for everybody by at all. But if it clicks with you, then it will get you, and it won't let you go. And I think that's. That's hugely exciting to to see in in a in an industry where a lot of gamers are maybe just a little bit jaded with with oh god okay it's another open world game I know what to expect or I I know what experience I'm going to be walking into it still feels like oh this is like a something that feels really fresh and, and kind of new and quite exciting and there is an abundance of that within within the space as well there I think the uh, the discourse a lot of the time fixates on maybe the wrong things like there isn't enough originality in in the industry but my god there's so much originality and a lot of stuff doesn't get surfaced especially from smaller developers and smaller indie games um but it's usually like the the mega titles the mega budgets that that typically draw the discourse of okay i know what this is it, it's it's like x style of game we know exactly what we're going to get but where's the originality kind of thing and you know the indie space is rife with that and i think again i love christina's taking this as well it's like the past kind of year couple of years indie games have been getting way more kind of recognition and exposure and i think that's fucking amazing that like the richest among the richest space is like the indie scene not that they're like the big triple a games don't have like rich originality, amazing writing, and you know all these other kind of things going on as well, because they certainly do. But certainly the indie scene, like there's way more experimental things going on, I think, and um, it's just it's just amazing that the industry can can give you like basically whatever you want. Um, there's always something to buy, pick up and buy and pick up and play. I love indie games. It's most of what I've played for the past I don't know how long like, it has been uh, indie titles I've been I, I just I got hooked once I joined lockdown um, and I built the the new PC and I started playing all sorts of like, just little bits and pieces because I, I could because I was back on I, I was back I checked out my existing Steam library I was like oh I bought a lot of stuff I haven't played yet and then just started immediately buying more and some of the games, like obviously, Phasmophobia was one, and since playing Phasmophobia, I have now played, um, partly thanks to Alan's obsession with looking for new ones, I have now played half the ghost hunting games on Steam. And some of them are great, some of them are not so great, but they're all interesting. Um, yep. But other stuff, like one, one of my biggest games in the past couple of years, and I, I'm, I'm dying to go back and replay it at the moment, is was Littlewood. Which was the the little sort of top down, like very Stardew Valley esque, but it's like after you've saved the world, there's no mm. consequences to this game. You're just rebuilding the village. Everything's nice, and I love it. It's one of the most relaxing gaming experiences I have ever had. And I am, you know, I I will play, crank it up to the highest difficulty, go in and and really torture myself with a game for hours. But at the same time, it's lovely just sitting there. And Cozy Grove was another one. Just rebuilding this little island, lots of great, great comedy in there as well. A ridiculously funny game to play. Um, so obviously, Stardew I've put God knows how many hours into. I cannot wait for the new one, Haunted Chocolate Here, the new one that's coming out. That looks awesome. 
So there's there's tons of stuff out there. And I try to take every game as... And I'm not saying I never complain or rage about a game while I'm playing it, but I try to take every game as very much... I don't. I try not to think of it in terms of bad design. I try to think of it in terms of this is what they wanted to build, and this is the game that they presented me with. So they want me to play it the way they wanted me to play it. And if I don't enjoy that, that's fine, and I'll put the game down and I'll walk away. But that's 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 a that's a me issue. That's not that's not them. They've done it. We we don't tend to do that with other forms of entertainment particularly that we don't contact authors and berate them because oh you wrote this in the first person <laughs> sure. why didn't you write it from a third person perspective it would have been a better book um you don't hear as much of it you get it much more in the games industry mm. so i so with things like that i mean my, my soul's experience was very simple i fired up what i like the first dark souls game i walked maybe three feet i got my head caved in by something and i thought I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I had to go and pick up the kids or something. So I was like, I'll come back to this. And I never did. Yeah. <laughs> and I just and every now and again I get a pull to do it. It's usually when you're playing it and I'm and I'm watching it and I'm like, Oh, but it does look good though. And then I think about it and I think about it and then I don't do it. Because I'm like, no, I'm just gonna die repeatedly and yeah. get annoyed and at some point I might take the plunge and I probably will thoroughly enjoy it, but the pull has to be there. Um, but Elden Ring has definitely sort of been tempting me because so many people are playing it and enjoying it, but I haven't taken the plunge yet. Yeah, but th- those, those like wholesome types of, of games, like the wholesome showcase that Nintendo do as well, I think they are, they're just a great tonic to the games that do want to like kick your head in or, uh, all the time at, at every opportunity. And you're thinking, oh, I, I, I'm not up for this tonight. I just want to plant some, some flowers or um, try and like grow some animals or attract some animals to my village and you know pet them and groom them and feed them and look after them and that's all i want to do or like in um like in lawnmower simulator i just want to cut the grass like that's it (laughs) i just want to do that (laughs) those kinds of games i will put far too much time into There, there are chores that i won't do around the house that i will do if they're in a video game because they're relaxing but I have stood it. I can't remember what game it was I was playing, but I was stood doing the washing up, and I remember my my, my ex wife turning to me and saying, you, "There's washing up that needs doing." I was like, "Which I will get to, but this this is this is the washing up I'm doing now." Um, yeah, it's, it's it's because it's giving you XP with every dish that you you wash. Yeah. Amy. that's why you're getting that that virtual reward which you don't get in real life. I'm working towards ten gamer score. That's desperately <laughs> important, obviously. So it's so true. It's so true. But um, no, I was actually um, gonna gonna segue on to um, because we're talking about indie games. Uh, the game Tunic, which uh, kind of just came out as well. Which um, again, it, it, it's that little kind of Zelda like kind of adventure game that looks super adorable, but apparently it's actually quite hard as well. And again, it's going back to like the indie scene of, of types of games. It's like you probably wouldn't get a game like that from a major like blockbuster studio, but indie devs are kind of c- coming in and giving us that kind of experience of games that that we probably grew up with. Um, you know, Death Door was last year. That's very kind of kind of similar vibe to it as well. It's like that isometric adventure game where they can really explore different kind of themes and mechanics and. Um, I haven't had a chance to play Tunic. I believe it's on Game Pass, so I do need to check it out. But it's been getting like amazing reviews, and um, you play this little fox, and it just looks—it's like this kind of polygon sort of um, aesthetic to to everything. It's like blocky, but it's also quite detailed, but with this kind of polygonal aesthetic, and and it just looks amazing. Um, have you guys had a chance to check it out at all? I've had a look at it. <clears throat> haven't played it yet. Um, it's on my wish list, so I'm probably yeah. going to buy it soon. Um, I've just been living on Elder Scrolls Online, so I'm trying to Ooh. break away from that for now and play something else, but I can't. Um, so one way to get people to play your game is make a fox character. Mm. Or a wolf, because <laughs> yep. I've played the, the, the poop out of Lost Ember, the first tree. Um... Anything with a fox, I'll play it. That, that's that's sold for me. Um, it has had very positive reviews on Steam as well. Like everyone just seems to be like really loving it. 
It's very cute. Mm-hmm. It does have like a old Zelda vibe feel to it. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing it. I think it yeah. looks very cute. It so. really, it really does. I know. Um, yeah. It's definitely as soon as you put <sighs> another one on the put an animal. Yeah, <laughs> as soon as you put an animal in a suit or just have an animal, that's it. Sold. Yeah, it's it's one of the things. Wherever there's a new new game showcase announced, and you see like a dog or a cat or or a fox or some kind of animal, <gasps> usually, the, yeah, usually usually the top comment is yeah, but can can I pet the animals? Like that's all I want to mm. do. I just want to pet the animals. If I can pet the animals, it's game of the year. <laughs> Let me pet, pet the animals. Pet yourself. <laughs> yeah. There's a a whole there's a, there's a whole Twitter feed of. I can't remember the name of it now, which is a real shame because they deserve recognition. Where their entire thing is any game that comes out with uh, oh, yeah. with a dog in it is, is it's something like "Can you pet the doggo?" And <laughs> they literally will go and find out and make sure the post is like, "No, it's okay. You can pet the doggo." It's yep. genius. But <laughs> Tunic I was going to say, I was just going to say on, on that point, I'm pretty sure that account has made companies put stuff in the game as well to pet animals. Yeah, I bet. See that pressure. That is the that's the <laughs> the market influence that we need. That's that's the way. That's the kind of pressure you want to see applied to game devs. It's just people going, "Yeah, but we really, 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 really want to pet the dog." Fine, but but I remember, it does look adorable. I'm, I remember I mean, in Ghost of, Ghost of Tsushima where you, you follow the foxes and a lot of the time you can pet the foxes afterward when you get to the little shrine that they're leading you to. But a lot of the time, the foxes run away before you can pet them. And, you know, the developers deserve the Twitter hate for putting that feature into the game. <laughs> How dare they not allow you to pet the fox after you follow it? That's just <laughs> rude. I'm kidding, of course. I first saw um, the, the foxes in Ghost of Shima when it was actually in development because um, oh. one of my friends was working on it and like I think I like nearly cried in the office because it was so cute and everyone yeah. was just like it's just a fox and I was like you don't you understand. don't understand yeah. <laughs> How dare you, you? it's understand. not just a fox. It's a fur baby. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. No, I, the uh the, the other thing I really like with Tunic and games like it, because it, like I, said, I haven't played it yet, but it looks adorable, but the thing I love about games like it is they have an aesthetic that they are always... It, it almost sounds like, a, 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 like I'm slagging them off. They have an aesthetic they are always going to look as good as they look right now. Like The, the more hyper-realistic a game gets, the more likely it is to get dated eventually, but some games, when the user obviously are more sort of you know kitschy or uh, cute art style... That will, in 10 years, that's still going to look awesome and look adorable. Like, it's not going to date. Um, it's the same, even like with, I've, I've been playing um, Sea of Thieves again lately, and uh, that is, it's that game's gorgeous. I mean, the water effects are ridiculous, but then they kind of had to be rare. Like, they, if Rare hadn't got good water in it, they were going to get a bad time. But it, the water effects are gorgeous, but the whole game, the art style and the characters and that, it's always going to look awesome because it's not trying to be true to life yeah but what, it, what they have done is made an incredibly polished version of the the look they've gone for yeah so and I, I love games like that because they it's nice they never get they never get spoiled by that that nostalgia moment where you go i'm gonna go back to oh dear this is terrible <laughs> right? so which i've had on a couple of occasions with with retro games like stuff that it's it's hard to play again because you look you remember all these you have fond memories and then you're playing it again and you look like it I can't even read the text because it's so like this is a shame but Tunic yeah it definitely falls in there for me I, I, anything like that will always get my attention because I like that uh, just cute folksy sort of folksy yeah folksy's probably the best best word I've got for it like, it's that nice art style and again yeah. soothing like games like that are just it's relaxing to play. It is. It's a very guys... good. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, uh, I was going to. I was going to ask if you guys remembered. Uh, do you uh, Viva Pinata on the Xbox? Yes. Like rare games. You know, talk about a series <laughs> that, needs, that needs to come back. You literally grow a garden to attract pinatas, and talk about an aesthetic that isn't true to life at all, but it's timeless. It still, it still holds up because the little pinatas. I love I, that game so much. 
I have had so many conversations in the dead of night with friends about how Viva Piñata needs to come back. I'm pretty sure I've tweeted Rare on more than one occasion when they've been talking about new games and saying, that's great, but where <laughs> is Viva Piñata? I put what feels like decades, and it can't be, but what feels like decades of my life into my garden on there. I rebuilt it and rebuilt it and rebuilt it over and over again. I love Viva Piñata with every fiber of my being and the fact that there isn't a new one is very upsetting to me <laughs> maybe we treat them of, enough i know we rare's one of those those enough. developers that has like such an amazing canon of of ips like in their back pocket and obviously now now xbox and microsoft kind of own all those like i i badly want a new banjo kazooie i don't know if that's ever going to happen anytime soon but i would love to see like the crash bandicoot remaster treatment the spiral remaster treatment for banjo one and two or something like that i would, I would love to kind of see that to get you know a grounding for is an appetite there for a new banjo game and you see how hugely popular spiral and crash are that then we got a crash four and um, because of that which was which is excellent and it's like viva pinata needs to get like i don't know if it's like, it would be like a remaster because it's, it's on the rare collection mm. which is kind of upscaled and uh, and obviously works on on modern consoles and TVs and stuff like that. But I would love. I, I don't even know what kind of game it would be. Would it just be the same kind of game, but some some more features, kind of like um, Animal Crossing, but with pinatas or something? I I don't know what the crossover would be. Like, what kind of game could it be that is kind of new um, for long-standing fans, but also getting in new fans uh, to it as well. But it just feels like it's if you're attracting or or breeding pinatas, whatever the mechanics are, surely like that is enough of a hook to get all of the Animal Crossing fans' attention and get them into to wanting this game. I would have thought, but hey, I'm not in game marketing, sadly. I don't know if you've played Bug Snacks, but that gave me like a, a Viva Pinata vibe just because of the humour that was in yeah. it and it's like so colourful and it's just it's just silly it's just silly like yeah, you, yeah. you eat a banana and you hand a banana <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah. Viva it was just you I don't know you fed them something and they just changed colour it's just it's just stupid yeah. <laughs> it was great I know. I know and they were so adorable and so like um, characterful as well with their expressions mm. and they have and, personalities oh. yeah totally yeah Totally, yeah. little paper mache <laughs> things. I love it. Mm. We need more paper mache <laughs> games, Jamie. Way more paper mache games. I'd be down for that I, again. Like kitsch art styles, though. Like uh, um, Yoshi's Woolly World. Yeah. Um, stuff like that as well. And uh, there was a game I was playing very recently. My brain has gone completely blank. It takes two. It takes two. Oh, is an yes. amazing game, mm-hmm. and the art style of that is stunning, and uh, and it and it you know it varies as well. Like the the bit where you're fighting with and against and with the, the squirrels, and uh, <laughs> just I mean I was in, in stitches playing it. Me and I played it, and uh, we recorded a let's play, partly recorded. I managed to. I managed to forget to record Al Sound for the first episode, so that went well. <laughs> oh, <But Jimmy. laughs> I am nothing if not a Mickey Mouse operation. So but the um the the yeah, again, the humour in that was fantastic, beautiful to look at. I grew to really hate that book every time he popped up and yelled oh. at me. Just <laughs> like I was starting to develop Yeah, every time. And it, it, it was I was developing like Guildmaster fable levels of disdain for this book. You know, with the, <laughs> your health is running low. Is it though? I think I'm doing okay. Your health yeah. is running low. You just told me, like, it got to a point where I was starting to get a little bit twitchy. Um, but yeah, anything like that. The, the other one as well, like, speaking of, of, of rare and cute games and things like that, is I would like to see Cameo come back. I love oh. Cameo. That was an awesome bit of kit. I was going to mention and, that because that also has the whatnot talking book as well. There's something about magical talking books as a theme here. Yep, yeah, I remember. You'll find me in the whatnot. I'm not going to go looking because you've said that 62 times in the past three minutes, and frankly, I'm tired of you, sir. But but awesome game. Um, this oh, there's so many games I'd like to see come back. 
cameo <laughs> is is definitely worthy of a, some kind of like remaster as well because that that was that was such a, a fa- like a family friendly kind of game it was like fantasy world you got to possess the different different creatures and you get their 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 skills and abilities and i remember at the time i mean i i played it a couple of years ago and thinking oh these graphics have dated a, a little bit but i remember being so blown away when you first go into like the open field kind of area and it was that hyrule moment of ocarina of time where it's like oh i, I get my horse and there's like armies uh, like fighting in on the plains of this this giant world and thinking holy crap this this was like one of these games it was a console launch for the 360 like this is this is the jump this is a, a technical jump of the next generation of games that we can get to enjoy and i'm thinking look how many characters are on screen all at once oh my goodness this is incredible great game Rose. You know what game I would love to come back as well? Christina will be will be familiar with this one. Tear Away Unfolded. I have that uh, on, the, on the PS4. Uh, Jamie, it's, it's a papercraft game, right? And it was amazing right. because... They, so they, uh, it was... To this day, I am still fully convinced that this game was the best example of the DualShock controls. Touch, it uh, uses the um, the sensor bar for touch. It uses the motion control, the six axis motion controls. It uses everything in such an amazing way, but it's all done in this this incredible like papercraft world. But what was also cool is you had the app tie in. So if you have a tablet or a, or a phone, you get the PlayStation app on it, and then you could draw shapes, and then that would be objects cut from paper and that you could put into the world so you could start doing i had bat i had snowflakes done as bat symbols you know this kind of <laughs> kind of nonsense stuff you could create like, like paper cut objects that would make up your like outfit for your character so i had like a oh, deadpool cool. one i had a stormtrooper one again you could fully tailor the paper craft stuff it was like that real world stuff into the virtual stuff and it was what i uh, it was came out on the the vita originally or was it the PSP? I can't remember. One of those two. Uh, I think was it was Vita, wasn't it? Vita, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Vita. And and then they brought it, they remastered it and brought it on the, the PS4. And that was my my first time playing it. And I thought, this is amazing. This is so original and so cool. And of course, the, the devs went on to do Dreams, which is an enormous, uh. incredible success of Creator Playground. But Tearaway Unfolded sticks with me as such a great game because you could draw your own objects and, and import them into the world and then the world becomes your imagination and it's easy to see how they got to dreams from that you know as um like what was that media molecule yes uh, yeah such yes. such a talented creative team unbelievable i don't think tearaway got enough love mm. that it should have got really totally um, totally but dreams is incredible um i got to work on that for a week and the amount of stuff I learned in a week was <clears throat> insane. I haven't played it since because I'm not very good at it. Yeah, um, same here. But like, I made a. Um, thought you don't have it anymore, but I made a whack a mole machine. The amount of like wow. physics and like stuff yeah. that was in that game, like, oh, it is in the game. Sorry, <clears throat> it was like a old school whack a mole machine. <clears throat> I made these really worm looking moles with like little hands at the side and like <laughs> big eyes um and i had a little hammer and it would just make it would just just pop up and it was like all retro colors because i just got a spray can of just <laughs> all over the thing because i had no idea what i was doing um but the amount of like mechanics in that game like every mole had its own like little what's it called yeah, movement animation thing. kind of um, popping up thing yeah yeah and like the score the, the scoreboard timery thing moved as well and i was just like yeah it's crazy it's like, dreams is insane yeah i haven't yeah. touched it in a while either but i keep seeing little videos popping up of people that have like recreated like big big games like within Fallout. the dreams dreams engine it's, it's someone's insane. doing horizon at the moment horizon yeah. forbidden west i was just what? like what it's insane yeah. It's incredible. Crazy. Mm. Media Molecule, a fantastic studio. I, yeah. Those devs are amazing. I know. And, and it, it was uh, for a while there, 
I was genuinely worried that PlayStation were going to just like shut them down or something like that because Dreams was taking so long to come out and there was this kind of unknown thing is like is Dreams actually going to be a success is this is what is going to like close the studio because it's such an experimental like conceptual thing like are people going to get it and thank god it seems like the the amount of creators that just generate stuff and then you can go in and you can sample if you're just a consumer versus not wanting to get stuck into the the dev side of it you can just go into all these little curated lists and start sampling out all these little mini games and experiences and you're thinking good on them good on them for for not just like supporting this kind of really crazy high risk vision on on PlayStation side but the devs for saying oh, we want to do this and this is something that could really yield just the most amazing experiences and like creativity uh, at its at its core like this a pure creation tool and engine and thinking god damn that's that's a hell of a risk but good on them that's that's amazing yeah a lot of love for dreams mm. definitely right next topic uh, that i know christina is going to be super excited for is the announcement that there's going to be a new witcher <laughs> the, the, the moment I found that out, so Roman's downstairs in the kitchen making food, and I just came up to check um my like Twitter and stuff, or see if my phone's got messages, blah blah. And on my screen was a medallion, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and then I clicked on it and was like, "No, no way!" I actually ran downstairs and I went. Yeah, so there's some news on Twitter. And I, I just screamed. Like, I was like, <laughs> it's a Lynx. It's a Lynx medallion. It's a new, It's got to be a new school. Mm. Um, are we going to be witches ourselves? Is it going to be Siri? I don't know. I'm really excited. I'm so scared. I'm ex- ugh, Emotions. Yeah. So we're obviously going, to, so be, going to be jumping into this for, for, for the next little, little uh, a few minutes but do you think it would be like a, like an RPG you create your own Witcher or do you think it is taking Siri because Siri was so like well developed in Wild Hunt and, and her gameplay sections whilst are, are kind of like no fail moments because she's ultra powerful in those in those sections but playing as Siri was was really awesome I actually really really enjoyed those sections and I thought hmm if there is a Witcher 4 then Siri is kind of like primed ready, like right there to maybe continue the series. But at the same time, I kind of like the idea of like create your own Witcher. Maybe you get to pick the skill or maybe it is just one skill that you are like assigned to and build your own Witcher that way. I don't know. Like either um, one is, is hugely excited for me. I'm not sure where the series story would go. Like, I don't know if they'd go for like, because at the moment she's... Um, no spoilers, but she's a vital part of the series on Netflix. I don't know yeah. if they do like maybe tie that in somehow and let Siri have that kind of story, mm. or we're going to start from the beginning as little Siri getting trained by Geralt and then growing up and then the Wild Hunt chasing you. I don't know what they're tying to. Um, but if there was if there was a school and a school of the Lynx and you make your own Witcher, I think that would be incredible. Like, but I don't know what story you do though. That's the only thing. Like, because mm. obviously The Witcher has a narrative. Um, so I don't know. Well, then again, Hogwarts, uh, Harry Potter has a narrative as well. Yeah. I mean, so I'm maybe, not too sure. Maybe just be a Witcher and go do Witcher quests and bounties and stuff. Um, yeah. I'm not I mean, sure if it would be linear. It I could don't know. even it could even take like the Commander Shepard Mass Effect kind of route where you're creating your own. Um, like Commander Shepard, essentially like the class and things like that, and like Renegade or Paragon kind of thing with your your answers building building the team. But mm. the 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 main story is obviously very linear. There's there's the beats there, but there's all this like stuff on the periphery for for side quests and well written side quests, which we know CD Projekt Red really really excel at. So it doesn't necessarily matter of you creating your own one because this character of Witcher whoever is instrumental in shaping these events that you play through on on the main line but there's all this other stuff on on the fringes to like like the bloody baron quest line things like that you know like like some of the other amazing quest lines from wild hunt um but creating your own witcher could be could be really awesome but i'm sure we mentioned this 
last podcast, didn't we? Because the board game was announced. And That's we right. Like, That's right. We were gushing over the, the, the board game. I'm pretty sure we said, wouldn't it be cool to have a Witcher RPG? Yeah. Maybe they listened. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they listened to the podcast and got, we gave them yeah. ideas. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll take like, credit yeah, for we'll that. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was totally our idea. Totally, totally. <laughs> Speaking of the board game, have you, have you, did you buy the board game? Have you played it at all? Because it uh, just um, reminded me of that. I was like, hmm, it's on, it still on pre-order, isn't it? I think. Oh, is it? I thought it was out. Okay. No, I think it's still, yeah, it's still on pre-order at the moment. Um, yeah, so no, it's not, it's not out yet, but I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah, still pre order. Just check Magic Madhouse and it's on pre order. I've got friends that are adamant that I, I need to get involved in D D, but D D scares me, so maybe maybe a Witcher board game might be a, a first step into going into D D. I don't know. Jamie's shaking no. his head it's like oh, you, you have don't, to go D D. You don't take a first step, you run headlong into the world <laughs> of Dungeons and Dragons. It D D of all of my hobbies and interests and geeky fascinations, D D is my favorite <laughs> um i love it i i love it to bits we were playing last night and unfortunately it got cut short because our dm wasn't too well but the last session before that we were we were dealing with the backlash of alan got eaten by a dragon <laughs> and uh because he fed himself to a dragon because God love him, his his character is of a school that worships dragons, so he truly believed right. that he could reason with it, and then when he couldn't, <laughs> he truly believed he could save us by feeding himself to it, so it wouldn't oh. eat us. And I'm sat, and it's one of those things with D&D, I'm sat here like, player knowledge, the minute it's finished eating you, it's killing all of us. You're doing nothing to help. <laughs> character knowledge, what a noble sacrifice my friend is making, but we must save him. Yeah, so... He goes down in the fight. He is he is at zero hit points. He's dead. And I play a bard, and I manage to use a healing word spell to pop him back up to one hit point in the dragon's mouth, at which point he gets eaten again. <laughs> and I kept bringing him back. So I realized that all I'm doing is forcing him to relive hell as he gets eaten over and over by a dragon and then eventually dies. Bitten in half, clean through, done. That's and a true friend, that. They would do that to another friend. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because to be honest, if nothing else, distraction. I needed to get out of there. So, but so we managed to, and then we managed to resurrect him, which was a whole thing. And now he has some. He seems to have developed some trauma related to that. I can't say I blame him. But it was a horrible experience. I ended the session happy to say, like in tears. I, I was tears streaming down my face. I get very emotional about my D and D. So I've got tears streaming down my face. Don't know what's happening. My my character. My, my gnomish bard, known, known only as Rock Throb Gusset, because I'm a child, is <laughs> he's messed up by it. And, and yeah, I came out of it. I, I walked through. My kids were here at the time, and I walked through and sat down, and they were like, you okay? I was like, no. No, I don't no, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I don't really need a moment. And it took me a good 20 minutes to decompress. It's very intense. But then the next episode, you can be shopping for four hours. And talking absolute nonsense and laughing at your DM's funny accents, love it. Best thing to do in the world. I, th- I think what so, scares me about D and D is is the length of time that the games can take. Is uh, do you, well, what's a typical session <coughs> looking looking like? It varies, probably two to three hours for a session. Okay, um, so two a, by then. A campaign could take the rest of your life. It depends on how your story goes <laughs> and how many sessions you can get in. I mean. We play maybe once a month, um, realistically, with everyone's schedule. Yeah. And it's, but it, it goes by very quickly, and then you can't wait for the next session. But you can do, I mean, it's, it's worthwhile like, knowing that you can do stuff like, you can do one shots, or you can do mini campaigns, so that you, you've got a sort of a time limit on it. You're like, look, you're going to do this adventure, and that's it. So you can, you can break it down into blocks. Mm. I'm working on. I'm, I'm currently building two campaigns for two different groups. I've got someone who's asked me to help them put together a world, and I, I'm planning on running my own campaign. I'm looking forward to getting into the DM's chair um, and sitting there and going to get. And I'm because it's me, and I'm a glutton for punishment. I was like, I'm home brewing everything, throw it all out. I'm, I'm making the entire world from scratch. I can't wait. I'll invent my own continent. And then I'm sat, and genuinely I'm sat there, I've got pieces of paper everywhere, I'm drawing maps and trying to work out, I'm terrible at geography. <laughs> and I'm like, where would, how would this landmass even work? Because 
And I realised that I've bitten off far more than I can chew, so reined it back in a little bit and used some pre-made assets. But it's, yeah. The, and the great thing is, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a big Witcher fan, and he's like, C- could you theoretically play a Witcher? I said, you can play anything. You can be anything. There is no what? limit to what you can do as as long as you find a way to make it worse. It's all it's all about balance. Um, you you know, you can have someone come into your game and go, I want to be a literal god. It's like, all right, technically speaking, we can do it, but there's going to have to be some way of balancing you because otherwise there's no fun to the game. <laughs> but you could be... I've got one of my friends wants to play a, essentially a World of Warcraft hunter, um, that sort of character. That's fine. Another friend wants to be a, a tabaxi uh, rogue... Um, basically, an assassin and thief. Yeah, that's easy enough done. And then another, another one of my friends, I think, wants to. He wants to play a fox. Um, he's a big fan of foxes. Really. He wants to play a fox. I was like, and I, I don't even. I'm sat there thinking, I'm not even sure if there's a fox race. So we'll, we'll come up with one. It'll be fine. We'll just tweak something. It'll be great. <laughs> so you and you can do it because it's all, it's all up there. So I love it. Yeah, just play D and D. Damn it, everyone play D and D. Well, you need to invite um, me, Jamie, or Christina, for that matter. I, I, <laughs> I, need, I need a team. Um, if you get the, if you if you were like starting, I think this is a good start. I think um, just because it's very simple is the Stranger Things D and D set. Ooh. It's it's tailored for you. Like it's you know it's it's all written by Will <laughs> Will Byers. Right. Ooh. The book it has a campaign that you just follow. You have a DM just read out everything. And you just you have a pre made list as well. Um, I think it's all of the the cast have their own like uh, what's it called sheet. And all you do is just play along with those those sheets. It teaches you D and D. It's Stranger Things. I love Stranger mm. Things. Um, yeah. And you also get a demogorgon little little cute mini yeah, figure as well, which is really cool. Yeah. So I think if you look at that, it's about twenty pounds on Amazon. It's right. a good way to learn D and D, even though it's very basic it's uh-huh. it's good so oh, it's a God, good it's suggestion a, it's, I think. it's a rabbit hole i'm gonna fall down isn't it <laughs> <laughs> oh it'll get you i mean it, it will get you i i my my love of D started in back in school i was i was big on the uh fighting fantasy uh choose your own adventure books yeah and but i wanted to do that but with friends and then they released one they brought out dungeoneer where it was like you can make your own fighting fantasy game and you can play it with friends and i was like okay and then I realised I didn't have any friends, so it didn't work so well. Um, I did, but I didn't have any friends who wanted to play it. So I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. I, I need buddies who are into it. So a, a couple of my mates tried it. It wasn't really for them. And then it was sort of out of that. It's like, have you... It's almost like someone comes up to you and goes, well, here's a little taste of Dungeoneer, but have you, have you tried Dungeons & Dragons? I'm like, Ooh, tell me more in this dark alley, stranger. So, And I got got fascinated by it. But again, never had anyone to really play it with. And then for years, it was something that I read about, was interested in, and didn't get to try. And then uh, a friend of mine announced he was going to be doing a Pathfinder session. And so yeah. three of us went and played Pathfinder. And that gave me that, which is actually where Rock was born, my, my, my little gnomish barred buddy. But back then, he was also undead. We, we, we homebrewed the hell out of him, and he was broken. It was terribly OP and wrong of me, but it was fun. But so it came up, we came up with the bard. I love bards because I like being goofy and singing and, and all this sort of nonsense. So it's definitely something for me. Um, but yeah, I fell in love. And of course, within that, I also uh, watched The Gamers and started watching Critical Role and then started watching other streamers, like a, a whole pile of different uh, streamers doing D and D content. And yeah, but now I I absorb dungeons I mean, you see there's a mimic sat behind me on my shelf. I've got the whole cast <laughs> of Critical Role back here. I've got I have thousands of dice I never even get to play in, in real world. It's all done with D and D Beyond online. So these dice have never been rolled. But I keep buying them because they're pretty. <laughs> and yeah, it just it's a it's a whole thing, and it, it does. It sucks you in. I've read, I've read the monster manual cover to cover more times than I can tell, just because the artwork in it and the lore of some of the creatures they've created for this is ridiculously cool. And yeah, I will. I could gush about that. That's a whole other. I could gush about D and D for probably a solid twelve hours without taking a breath. So <laughs> I'll I'll rein myself in, but definitely play D and D. And I would. Uh, 
And but the the Witcher board game does look awesome. Like bringing it back around and. Any sort of tabletop gaming, really, I highly recommend. It's just, it's so much fun to sit down around a table with friends, even if you have to do it online due to, obviously, life and restrictions and distance and anything else that's going on in the world. But any sort of, uh, like, TTRPG type stuff is... Warhammer. Brilliant. Warhammer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I managed to stop myself getting into Warhammer a while ago again. I, it's, it's a battle I have several, because I know what will happen. It'll be. I'm just gonna. I'm just. I just want to paint minis. That's yeah. what starts me off. I'm so getting I'm like, my fix from, from Christina's Instagram account of seeing all the new little miniatures that she's painting. It looks amazing. So good. I know. That's a rabbit hole, though, as well. So we're not going to that. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> What's the latest one you just you just purchased? Because I didn't you didn't you um post about some new ones just uh, recently? Yeah, uh, my Inquisitor. Yeah, I got him from. Warhammer cool. World. It's Very like an exclusive one. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Rowan just bought a load as well, so he's currently building next to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, See, he's got Daughters of Cain, though, so his are Warha- like sneak people and stuff. Warhammer is a, f- is a series that I've always thought should be, in terms of like, um, in terms of like media um, games and movies and, and that kind of context, I always felt should be just as big as Star Wars, if not bigger, because there's so many books, there's the board games, there's all this incredible like history and amazing stories. I've picked up a couple of books um, to to on my Kindle and stuff like that, and they're really awesome so far. And I think, why hasn't it ascended into something just as big as Star Wars? And in terms of in terms of like game licensing, in terms of movies or TV projects, animations, that kind of stuff. And it always struck me as, as really strange as why why it hasn't. Is it just because it's so so like dense and so packed with information that it's hard to create these things out of? I don't know, but it always struck me as like it's huge. It is absolutely huge. It has an amazing fan base. Like again, millions of people, just as much of those that are like Star Wars fans love um or sci fi fans love like Warhammer and that kind of thing. It's like, why hasn't it transcended into like mainstream media as well? And there's tons of games that come out for Warhammer, but they're so hit and miss. There's a lot of just drivel, and there's a couple ones that are pretty good. Speaking of, I'm hugely excited for Space Marine 2. I can't wait yes. for that, because because that looks yes. fucking yeah. incredible. It looks so good, and I, and I love the first one. Uh, uh, the, the Cockney orcs as well, that were always like, Space Marine! You know, it's hilarious, so I can't wait to see what they're going to do with that. And whether it's co-op, whether it's single player, I don't know, but like four player co-op Space Marines sounds like it's just a, a instant win. But it looks amazing. But yeah, it's just a, a kind of I'm not it's not I'm not really asking a question to either of you, but if you want to stab a guess, it's like why isn't it like way bigger in terms of other other medias than it is already? I don't know. I'm gonna say pass, because I, I... <laughs> yeah. It's too I big a question. Give you an maybe. Yeah. yeah, but it is getting more popular. So, yeah. I suppose it's there have been attempts. I suppose I, I suppose what it is more than anything is that there have been attempts to sort of uh, push it in another direction, like to get more eyes that haven't always landed. Um, I know there was a Warhammer movie, um, but in but not in name. There was Event Horizon is based. This is something that Alan glories in telling people about, and I'm telling it second hand. So if I'm wrong, don't come at me. Find <laughs> Alan, give him help for it. But the the story I told me was that basically the uh, the Event Horizon film, which fantastic horror film. Uh, the the basis of it is from a Warhammer story that the guy wrote that he wanted to make a film about and was told oh. it's too niche. People won't want it. So he stripped out the Warhammer, tweaked it a wee bit, but right. based it around some of the like darker lore of the Warhammer series that he wanted to, to tell. So that's where Event Horizon originally came from. How much it got diluted by the time it came to the film, I don't know, because I don't know... I, I like Warhammer, but I don't know enough about the lore to sit there and sort of pick it apart and say, oh, well, that's... You know, miles removed or quite close, but games wise, and I'm going to try not to punch my my microphone as I do this. I will. God, no, I managed to. I will say that has sat next to my PC for since I got the game. But that I don't know if you can see it at all. Is Dark Warhammer Dark Omen? Oh, Dark Omen. Dark Omen. Oh, okay. 
that game was fantastic. I loved that game. And mm. it has its detractors, and I disagree with all of them. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I like strategy games, and that I really enjoyed. Um, and that was the, the the little key rig that came with the PC copy back, back in the day. And it's been sat next to my PC ever since. I loved that game. Um, but yeah, again, I don't think it quite landed. I think that's that's it. It's, I don't think it's that it wouldn't get you know embraced by people i think it's just that if you have if you have attempts that don't quite hit it doesn't uh it just doesn't happen it's not happened naturally yet so but it's like you know as christina said it's the popularity is there and it's it's increasing i don't think henry cavill hurt that by talking about uh you know i mean he's going to be cast as an inquisitor or something isn't he he's going to get the the project greenlit or something. I'm down. Let that dude whatever he <laughs> do whatever he wants, absolutely, and then and just let the fans flock to it. I mean, it works. Yeah. <laughs> right. Henry Cavill but, must be protected at all costs. He oh yeah, he should. is. He's he's on a list of people which must be taken first to the bunker at the end of days. <laughs> so, absolutely. Okay. okay. Last last topic, real real quick, because we are running into ninety minutes here. Um, PlayStation finally announced their their new subscription service, which many were uh, dubbing as a Game Pass competitor. I'd love to get um, your both of your thoughts on this. Rather than a Game Pass competitor, it, it's not. For me, my understanding and from reading the information on it, it's not really a Game Pass competitor, but it is a new. Um, service based on the different services that PlayStation currently offer that they're kind of amalgamating into uh, an easier digestible structure of services and it's the different tiers so there's PlayStation Plus the um, I can't even remember the names of them actually like Pro Pro Essential um, Extra like and Premium extra, or, <laughs> extra and Premium there we go thank goodness for Christina uh, bringing, up, <laughs> bringing up the article um <laughs> So, so the the big takeaway that I think everybody's a little bit Twitter being being Twitter is a little bit um, irked about is that like there's not the first big first party games that are landing on the service at the same time as when they're launched as what Game Pass currently does over on Xbox. All the big first party games are launching day and day on Game Pass. That was like one of the biggest sellers for that service. Whereas PlayStation are still going to be selling their their main games, but this service is an amalgamation of the PS Now, which was their streaming service, as well as adding some extra things in there as well. So you're going to be getting access to a massive catalog of games that are already, I guess, out. Um, there's a lot of historical ones like uh, like the PlayStation Two games, PlayStation Three games that you can that can be streamed. Um, that will be, I guess, the PS Now kind of service that's getting getting smashed into this new service as well as like other things that are downloadable games and other kind of benefits as well so starting with with christina what do you think about about the service as a whole and it's kind of answer to game pass it's interesting <clears throat> i mean it's probably useful for people who don't really want to spend like because each game that comes out now is roughly about 70 60 expensive yeah 50 quid um so if you've got a subscription pass that lets you play these games and you're not paying too much a month for a game it's probably useful um i don't use playstation plus anymore to be honest um just because every month there wasn't exactly any benefits really that i enjoyed if there was a game that i already had that month Mm. i didn't need to to resubscribe because I already had it. Um so I think it's it's quite handy. Um yeah, I probably won't look into it in too much detail. Like um I just buy my games outright so yeah. um the discounts are good though as well. Um people love discounts. That's that's so. the thing, it's like I, I I very rarely play online games anyway, and usually I'm a, I'm I'm mostly on Xbox. Occasionally I'll play online games on on PlayStation, um, but I do like the store discounts. So mm-hmm. there, you know, th- that's obviously a, a big kind of boon boon for, for my kind of um, uh, subscription kind of the way I play games. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's difficult because I like you know the the PlayStation first party games that come out. 
they're always bangers they're always phenomenal they're always like must play games and i always buy them and had that been okay this is launching all these games are launching on that service at, on launch day day and date then i would upgrade to premium like without question but because it's not i'm less inclined to up my my ps plus subscription model i may as well just keep it exactly the same because i use it as a kind of bare minimum um, and i'm still going to buy like the next god of war the horizon forbidden west whatever the next ghost of tsushima turns out to be i'm still going to buy that the next spider-man i'm definitely going to be buying spider-man too um so it doesn't it doesn't really give me any any other benefits but as you've said for for and it is a luxury to be able to say oh i, I could just go out and buy that game essentially pretty much whenever i want not all of them in the same month but you know i, I can buy a big game uh, on, on a month basis sort of thing but those that obviously can and it is a huge cost they're getting access to a massive library of games and i just noticed there on the on the premium one there's an additional 350 sorry 340 games added on top of the 400 games which is the the extra kind of the middle tier of of subscriptions we obviously don't know what those games are just yet. They don't have a catalog list just yet, but I can imagine that there's got to be tons of stuff there to play, whether it's really, really old games or if it's fairly modern games or, or if games that are like a year old, then they go into the service or is it six months, they then they go into the service. Obviously, that these are questions that have to be kind of answered or is it they have to be on sale for two years before they can migrate into the service and you get them for free all kind of valid questions and obviously concerns but again it's giving access to a huge library of games without users having to buy them all individually which can only be a good thing ultimately can only be a good thing you make a good point as well um i don't play online a lot if i play online it's on my pc yeah. um and i don't think there are correct me if i'm wrong but i don't i don't believe there are too many online games at the moment that people will play, um, especially on PS5. I don't think there's anything. Hmm. Yeah, Elden I mean, Ring, that that yeah, counts, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Re Returnal so. just this did that new co-op mode, so there's things like that. Oh, Obviously, yeah, yeah. like the tiny, tiny Tina and the t the typical big, oh, yeah. big first-person <laughs> yeah. shooters, um, like like Battlefield, like uh, Call of Duty. They're obviously big, big Still. multiplayer um, kind of games. Yeah. But whether Most whether Call of Duty is going to go into the service, I don't know. Most of the most things that come out are like Horizon single player. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. You know, Elden Ring. Most of the time, it's single player because it is. The, the progress is a bit annoying. Um, uh, yeah, I assume people are going to re be replaying The Witcher Three. <laughs> so that's another single player <laughs> game people are going to be on yeah. for the foreseeable. Um, yeah. So I feel like the online benefits, I definitely wouldn't use them. So. Mm. It's true. Like the, the big, the big draw of PlayStation games is the first party stuff, which is typical single player, amazingly mm. crafted games, which doesn't add anything to to this particular service. If God it of did, War. yeah, God of War. Exactly. It, it, it mm. Had those games been a part of this, then again, it's like it's just like Game Pass being being a no brainer. It's like you tell me, I don't have to buy um starfield when it comes out because it's coming to game pass i don't have to buy the next elder scrolls because that's going to be on game pass amazing let's just let's just do that the, the you know the next gears of war that is a very easy sell to consumers whereas i think this is a tough sell to get existing users to upgrade to that premium service but also it might be a harder sell to get lapsed playstation plus users to invest in the service i'm not i'm not too sure who it directly appeals to other than i just want access to a shitload of games without having to buy them all individually and that's the that's the that's the equivalent factor of game pass and 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 this new service for playstation which is certainly valid and it is a great opportunity for consumers to say i've just got a playstation it comes with a year of playstation plus premium service now um I've now got access to 700 games, older, newer. We don't obviously don't know just yet, but that's still a great deal, ultimately. See, I have touted the 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 joys and wonders of Games Pass in nearly every conversation I've had. 
uh, on on here and on any other like, and on stream and all sorts. Like Games Pass for me is one of the the easiest uh, purchases I make every month. Like that that is money well spent every time because. As you said, everything's it, the amount of day one content that is there for mm. what is basically a ten a month, or, or, or however much it actually is now. I think it's eleven, isn't it? But is insane, and I've got that across my Xbox and my PC, and the it has vastly uh, increased my library of games that I haven't played, which is very frustrating because I keep looking at, and then they keep bringing out new ones, and they won't give me any piece. But the amount of titles, the, the 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 drawing point for me, like one of the big drawing points of these services, is the day one content. If you know mm. that you are paying a monthly fee, and when that brand new game hits, you're playing it. You don't have to think about when you're buying it, are you buying it, etc. You also get that that peace of mind of knowing it's like I'm not going to drop fifty, sixty, seventy quid on a game that I turn out to hate. I am going to, which has happened to me before, not often. I'm usually pretty well pleased with most games I pick up because usually I've you know I've wanted them for long enough by the time I buy them but Halo Infinite would be a really good example for me I would have bought Halo Infinite day one I would have been disappointed with Halo Infinite if I had bought it day one and that is with said with no nothing but love in my heart for that franchise but it is there are problems surrounding that game it is not all it could have been and I would have been a little peeved with it as it was day one Games Pass, I'm still giving it a chance constantly. I'm like, yeah, it'll get there, it'll get there, it's okay, it'll get there. I think not having the the same sort of day one draw, this is gonna is is gonna suffer a wee bit. And obviously, it's difficult for me to say because I'm not a PlayStation user, so I'm I'm not gonna get it anyway. So, um, the back catalogue is always a thing for me that companies use with anything like any of these services. They're always like, we've got this huge back catalogue of games. I think. I always sort of think, yeah, but I guarantee you like 80% of them are not great or not going to get played that much. So when when you're saying we've got a catalogue of 700 games that you can play the minute you pick it up, it's like there's going to be a lot of games in there that are maybe not so so popular, not so, so, so big of a deal. But the beauty of it is if you've got enough drawing power from everything else, People end up playing those games, and then they remember the game that they loved when they were ten, or they find the little indie game that they wouldn't have played otherwise. I mean, I got hooked on Boyfriend Dungeon, which I probably wouldn't wouldn't have picked up <laughs> because yeah. it wouldn't have crossed my radar necessarily. But because yeah. it was on Games Pass, and I was like, "Oh, this looks interesting," and I just, "Oh, I love it! Fantastic game." Um, Ember. I, chances are, I might not have got around to playing Ember because it wasn't. I, I hadn't seen anything about it, but it popped up on Games Pass. And I was like, "Looks interesting. Tried it. We played it. You know, I've yeah, played it with other yeah. friends. It's it's hilarious. Love Ember. Um, and there's tons of games like that that have only crossed my desk, so to speak, because of the fact that they're on Games Pass, and so they're they're there for the taking. Like, give them a go. You might as well. Yeah, so, yeah. But that's a big unknown, right? About the, about this list is. One of the, one of the draws of Game Pass is the deals with external publishers and developers that their games are going to be on this service. A lot of them are launching on launch day, like Aliens Fire Team Elite launched on oh. Game Pass, which is which is great. And again, it's a game that I probably wouldn't have bought Im- immediately. Um, I love Aliens, but I. I'm obviously very wary of the you know the quality bar of of the aliens franchise in video games and ember is another one you know you you mentioned um a couple there jamie and also like death's door that was that launched on game pass so i'm really curious to find out more information about what playstation are doing are, are is that going to include these third party relationships and deals with square enix or ea or well, probably not ea because they have play which is now part of game pass ultimate but maybe they do roll in ea play into this playstation service eventually as well um ubisoft's uh service which is a subscription model on pc there's rumors that that was going to be a partnership with um game pass at some point so maybe then all the ubisoft games would be on game pass is something like that potentially in the works to, to be part of this 700 games library and i'm really curious to find out more if that is the case because then you've got a great message and a great sales um opportunity to say guardians of the galaxy is going to be on playstation premium 
you don't have to buy it. It's going to be, it's, you know, the next one, um, Guardians 2, whatever, um, from Square Enix, we have a deal with the next Final Fantasy is going to be part of PlayStation Premium um, for Spoken, which is the next kind of big one from Square Enix. Maybe that's going to be on, it's not a first party game, so it doesn't, they, they, they don't, they're not in that um, conversation of saying no first party games are going to be on the service. Uh, maybe eventually they will. Or, I mean, for day and day launching, but maybe things like Forspoken could launch on the premium service. So I'm really curious as to whether that conversation is still being had or is this clarity around what these 700 games actually, you know, involves and, and includes? Because there's a lot there that they can do with this. Now that they have this model that they've announced, what they can do with it and what they can evolve it into is, of you know, un- unlimited, really. Just like what Game Pass has now evolved into. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I can't imagine trying to sell Game Pass to someone off the back of turning around and going, hey, you can play Age of Empires 2 and Hexic and, like, and running <laughs> through some of these old games... People are generally going to be like, I've already got it, or I can already play it. Or I've, the amount of argument I see online where people are like, emulators are a thing. Like you, you see that all the time. It's like, why am I buying a retro game? I've got emulators. I've got I've got the disc sat in storage. I've got an emulator so I can play it on my PC. Why am I? So you get that, and I think you, you need the you need that. Um, oh, marketing term. You need the you need the USP. You need the unique selling point of being able to go right. We are going to give you day one access to these huge games and a whole bunch of other stuff, which when you get in there, that's what's going to... And that will keep you coming back as well, because there there are periods of time where there's not a big game coming to Games Pass day one that I'm particularly hyped for. So it's that's not what's keeping me paying for it. What it is, is now I've got access to this library of awesomeness. I'm not... I don't want to let go of it. There's too yeah. many things in there that I can play. And... But I was drawn in. The, I signed up for Games Pass when I can't remember what game it was. But there was a game dropping, and it was going to be day one Games Pass. And by, rather than buy it outright, I just signed up for the service. I was like, "No, I'll do that, and I'll try it." Yeah. And I still buy games. Like I'll still once I've played it on this, and I'm like, "Right, I'll let's see if I can get a collector's edition." Or I'm going to buy that so I own it, and it, you know, and and. I still do it. I, I've bought games that are literally never going to leave Games Pass, and I've questioned myself for doing it. I'm, like, I'm, I'm just spending <laughs> money for the sake of it now, yeah. which is a stupid thing. But, yeah, I think if you've got that drawing factor, and then you keep them hooked with everything else you've got. So PlayStation could absolutely do that, but until... I would say anyone who's, who's looking at buying it, until they know exactly what they're going to be getting, is probably going to be reticent at this point, right up until actually get some more info so it'll be interesting to watch definitely definitely it's, uh, it can only be good in the long run for the consumer to give them more access and more options which is yeah. always a great thing yeah. I'm waiting for the announcement that um, Hogwarts Legacy is going to launch on the service and now I'll say god damn it now I have to subscribe to PlayStation Premium <laughs> I'll be about right yeah probably going to happen so guys that is uh, that is the end of episode 72 of the weekend catch-up club podcast thank you to everybody who has been tuning in and listening and and god forbid watching and you can see our mugs over on the youtube channel your support is hugely appreciated so thank you so much for for subscribing and keeping keeping our little lights on and keeping everything going a massive thank you to christina of course the associate external producer at tell at uh, traveler's tales games um for being our guest today thank you christina thank you for having me again <laughs> yeah I, number five exactly we're going to go all the way up and see how many times we can get you back as a guest because it's always a treat to, to have you and, and to blather i with love you games well. i'll keep coming <laughs> yeah so speaking of when when can can gamers get their hands on lego star wars the skywalker saga 5th of april it launches in three days awesome the day after it's my birthday it's going to be a birthday treat to myself and it's available on like pretty much all platforms i believe yes Please awesome so. so no excuses gamers get out there and get get trying it because it looks amazing and little plastic uh, lego blocks have never looked more real it looks phenomenal it's absolutely brilliant <laughs> anyway take care everybody we'll see you on the next one i um, happy gaming bye-bye bye, bye.